coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. We're talking golf spill science with Dr. Chris D'Elia from Louisiana State University. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode 52 for Monday, June 28th, 2010. More questions than answers. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Carbonite. Backing up the files on your PC or Mac is safe and easy with Carbonite. For a free trial plus two free months with purchase, go to Carbonite.com. Offer code Kiki. Welcome everyone to Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki and this is the hour of science. The hour that we just spend the entire time talking about one topic in science with one expert. And our expert today is going to help us understand what's going on with the Gulf oil spill. Um, we're going to talk about the science. We're going to talk about the scientific response on the local and federal level. We're going to talk about what we already know from our unfortunate experiences with previous oil spills, hopefully be able to talk about what we're learning currently about this particular oil spill and, you know, just kind of find out what the situation is and, uh, and where the science stands at the current moment. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Chris D'Elia. He is a, the Dean of the School of, of Coast and Oceans a and coast environment. and environment, sorry, at Louisiana State University. He has co-authored over 60 scientific publications on the nutrient dynamics of estuaries and coral reefs and on science policy. He is a zoologist. His PhD is in zoology. And, um, he's, and, and hopefully he's going to bring a, a bit to bear of on the biology, the ecology, the environmental implications of, of what's actually happening there in the Gulf. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to have you on the show. Kiki, it's great to be with you today. So, can we, to get started, you're in Louisiana. You're on the Gulf. W what is, what is the, the feeling there? What is, what is happening there socially? Well, it's somber to say the least. Uh, people are extremely concerned with just about every aspect of this uh, horrendous situation we're in. Uh, Louisiana is a state that uh, really embraces its coastal areas. And uh, it's just part of, uh, of everyday life here for, for so many different reasons. Um, the license plates say sportsman's paradise. Uh, people really do get out and hunt and fish and use the environment for their own pleasure. They use it to uh, conduct business, uh, a huge fishing industry down here. We have the second highest fishery yields in the United States, second only to the state of Alaska, wow. which is much bigger. Yeah. We have 40% of the nation's wetlands. So it's a, it's a very environmentally uh, uh, focused area. And it has the, the challenge that it's also an energy state. So the difficult balancing of energy and uh, environment is one of the challenges that, that uh, the state has to deal with. And this is a, it's, 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 it's been a constant challenge. I mean, there, have, there are oil rigs throughout the Gulf. And this is, you know, this was a new well that was being drilled and at a depth that is, you know, they're starting to get deeper and deeper into the Gulf. But the question of what you do, uh, how many, how many rigs do you allow? How many wells do you allow? I'm sure this is something that uh, Louisiana and the other states on the Gulf are constantly try having to deal with. Well, they, these states have been dealing with this for a very long time. There yeah. are something like 30,000 wells that have been uh, drilled in, in, uh, in the Gulf since the uh, late 40s, I believe. So this is not um, 
something new to people down here. What I think is, is new is the fact that these wells are going deeper and definitely uh, that this is a serious spill at a, at a great depth. And that's, that's a huge challenge. It, it's, it is, ironically enough, a fairly safe enterprise under normal circumstances. They, they've drilled many, many wells without uh, an incident, at, uh, a serious incident at all. And in fact, the biggest challenges have been in the transshipment of oil in the past. Right. So this, this is really one of the, the first real problems we've had in the Gulf. The other large one, of course, was the Ixtoc, uh one that happened back in the late 70s in the southern part of the Gulf down in Mexican waters. And that was a, that was a very, very large spill. Looking at spills of the past and, and what we've learned from spills of the past, is this spill, I mean, is it just the magnitude of it? Is it significantly different ecologically from other spills that, we, that we've seen happen and that, we, that scientists have had a chance to look at? Well, let's compare it to Exxon Valdez as a good, as a good starter. Um, Exxon Valdez was, a, was essentially an event that occurred over a, a couple of day period of time. So the oil got into the environment and then it had to be dealt with. This is a, a chronic problem. It's been going on for over two months now. So every day is, an, is, is essentially a new spill, a new event. And that is an extremely challenging situation. Yeah, in terms of the, the having to deal with the consistency of this spill, the, everything, the, the, the leaking that, that is taking place, the, the amount of oil and natural gas that's coming out. We know that there are natural oil seeps. Um, People have talked about using microorganisms or, uh, you know, finding bacteria that eat oil as a way of, of cleaning up the mess. Is that, is, is that realistic? Well, absolutely is realistic. The, uh, the natural seeps are, are assimilated by the, nat the uh, natural environment. That's been known for years. There are uh, bacteria that uh, are, are uh, consumers of uh, the various kinds of things that you find in, in, uh, in, in oil. So that that's not a, that's not an issue. It's the rate of uh, of the ability of it's the ability of these organisms to do this at a huge rate is is what is the real challenge. They're being overwhelmed by the amount of oil that they're receiving in 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 some places, and and they can't keep up with it. I've, uh, I asked a whole bunch of my Twitter followers. I asked them what questions they would like answered in relation to the the oil spill. And one question that continu that continued to come up was the um, the dispersants and the chemicals that have been used to try and clean up the oil uh, as one method of cleaning it up. Um, they're really toxic. What are the the biological effects? The the chemical effects of these of these substances. Well, uh, there's been a fair amount of work done with uh, dispersants on the surface of uh, water, but there has never been anything uh, done uh, to look at what the uh, effects at depth would be. When we're talking here, uh, 1,500 or more meters down, it's really deep, very different kind of environment. And as you, as you know, as a scientist, the, the, uh, the, the pressure is very high as you go down in, a, in, in the seawater. And um, we're dealing with essentially 150 atmospheres of pressure, which is a lot. Uh, we're dealing with very low temperatures, somewhere in a four to six degree range. So uh, you're going to see different chemical properties of things at that depth. That's one reason why we see hydrates form, for example. Methane that would normally be a gas is, uh, is uh, it, you know, going back to your basic chemistry, is going to be essentially a solid state. So mm -hmm. that changes the whole mix and makes it much more challenging to understand. So we don't know, is it more toxic at depth? Is it less toxic? Is it able to uh, work uh, as efficiently as a dispersant? I think there are a lot of questions that really... Uh, are being wrestled with right now, uh, certainly by the federal partners and some of the academic units. It seems like there's a lot of um, oh, we'll just we'll just figure it out as it, as it, as we go along. The the scientific uh, the, the the problem like what <laughs> is it going to cause a lot of problems? Well, we don't know, but we know the chemistry works this way usually. So let's let's see what happens. And so it's kind of a, a try it, you know, try it and see what happens kind of science. Yeah, it's kind of remarkable that it wasn't really anticipated at all. 
I do know that uh, some people at this university and other universities uh, some time ago had proposed uh, studies of, of deep sea spills saying that it was a risk. But uh, I don't think very much has been done on that topic. And, and uh, obviously it's too bad because yeah. now we find ourselves in a live experiment. That's not the kind of experiment we like. <laughs> no, no, it's not the kind of experiment. And, and without like. a control, I might say. Right. <laughs> So that's not, it's not very scientific in a certain, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not science. It's more just the observation of the effects and what's happening and maybe we'll learn something from it. Well, I, I, I gather you're a neuroscientist and you're probably used to doing experiments all, yeah. all, all the time. And, 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 and in my business, I'm in, in the oceanography, marine biology business, uh, we are able to do some experiments, but in other, in other cases, our, our observations are what uh, is, is all we have. And in this case, yeah. there, are, there are a lot of observations that need to be made, and then we can probably do, uh, do some kinds of uh, uh, laboratory-based exper experiments to try to replicate nature and, and learn from that. But it is a very challenging way to, to, to learn, and uh, you sure don't like to have to do it real time. I, <laughs> You know, I think one of the things that people have never really appreciated is just gearing up to go on an oceanographic cruise is a huge task. You've got to get a lot of gear assembled. You've got to get a scientific party together. You've got to find a ship. You've got to find the money for the ship. You've got to find the money for the science. You've, if you don't have all the chemicals you need, you got to need to rush order them uh, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a monumental challenge. And uh, so it's not something you do on day two of a spill like this. It's, it's really, uh, it's really a whole new world for us. Right. Yeah. And, and it's also made, made more difficult by the, um, just the, the blocks put on the area, the company, the, the law enforcement, keeping people out. You probably have to now get special permits if you're a scientist and you want to go do work in the area. Um, there's probably, is, is there a lot of bureaucracy now involved in, in trying to study it? Oh, it's huge, and 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 it has to be. Uh, uh, there there have to be security considerations. Uh, we can't have ships running into each other. We can't have people interfering with the uh, operation of the remotely operated vehicles, et cetera. So they have a lot of coordination to do. It's a very formal process managed by the Coast Guard, and uh, people are very much excluded from the central operation area unless they have special permission. Uh, yeah. But, you know, in addition to the things you mentioned, um, we have other issues that are of concern. Hazmat training, for example, hazardous material training. Uh, people aren't allowed to, to go out into, uh, into the thick of things without some assurance that they know what they're doing and are, are going to be careful with the risks that are involved. Yeah, what are, what are some of the risks? I mean, we've heard of um, uh, breathing some of the, the chemicals, the gas, the, uh, um, is there, there contact the hazards as well from the, the oil? A absolutely, uh, it, it, especially in the areas very close to the well site. What we have happen with uh, an oil like this is as it ages on the surface, uh, there is a volatilization of the lighter weight fractions, which happen to be the more toxic fractions also. So uh, I, I suppose that's a bit of good news in the sense that as that stuff moves along the surface with currents and then eventually reaches the coast, it's aged enough that the the most deadly and most toxic fractions are, are, are volatilized and mm. dispersed in the air. And you're sort of left with the, the heavy uh, 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 asphalt tinic, uh, tinic uh, and, and other fractions that are the gooey, uh, awful residues that, that the birds get stuck in. Right, the tar balls that are washing up in the... Exactly, exactly. So considering the different, um, I guess, the environments that we're, that we're looking at in the Gulf, there's the deep water environment, there's the uh, coastal estuary environment. Um, what kind of, uh, I guess, ecological concerns are, 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 you, are, are scientists considering different ecological concerns in those different areas? Absolutely. Different areas respond very differently. They have very different kinds of things going on. The, uh, the, the fauna, for example, are very different in the deep sea compared to what you would see on the shelf or in an estuary. Uh, so the, all those things are being taken into consideration. It's interesting, for example, that the uh, experimental work taken uh, that's been done on 
on the toxicity of dispersants has been done on organisms that aren't necessarily found in the deep sea, mm. uh, certain kinds of mycids and things like that. So uh, there's real concern about how transferable the information is that we've learned from these test organisms to organisms in an unusual environment such as the deep sea. And again, it's unfortunate. It's a an, an ongoing experiment that we didn't really mean to get into. Um, so with the the more coastal um, areas, we're not necessarily dealing with the, um, like you said, the volatiles, the maybe more toxic components. It's Is, is it just the 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 sticky tarry stuff and it's just weighing the birds down it's getting um getting on the food that they eat they're ingesting it um what are what are the i guess the problems yeah that's that's th those are certainly some of the problems that that people are concerned about but it also may may be that some of the uh the dispersed oil is uh is solubilized and some of the lighter fractions by virtue of the fact that they're dispersed are able to get uh closer to the shore um, I, I think that's unlikely because uh, I'm hoping it's unlikely <laughs> yeah. because I think that those lighter weight fractions are going to be microbially degraded at a pretty rapid rate and they won't reach the shore even in a, a more sol solubilized form. But still, it's a concern that we have. And uh, there's no doubt that even the, the so-called non-toxic fractions, the heavier fractions, are, they're really less toxic, they're not non-toxic. Right. And they can have they can have uh, problems as they enter the food chain. Thinking about the the deep water stuff, the oil that's coming out, they're not going to be able to get all the oil. I mean, is what are what are the techniques that are, that are being used? There's the chemical dispersant. There are the like feathers and things, the bags of feathers well, they're trying to yeah. use to absorb the oil. Um, what are all the different techniques that are being used? And are there any new techniques that are trying to be developed for this? Well, from what I understand, and I'm not uh, an oil expert per se, but right. boy, I've sure gotten a heavy dose of oil in the last two months. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, you've got a couple of things in your in your toolkit. You can, as you said, use dispersants, and that's got some advantage because it it will uh, truly uh, disperse the oil and presumably make it more microbially degradable, which is the hope. Uh, and also dilute it in some cases, and, and diluting is is uh, is an important uh, thing in in case of pollution. Uh, and then you can um, physically remove it by uh, by uh, sucking it up, or by uh, somehow uh, mm -hmm. absorbing it with hay, with you said feathers, uh, you know, human oil hair. Sticks. <laughs> you choose anything anything you can think of. Oil will will stick to so bounty uh, the clicker picker upper. <laughs> yeah, and, and in some cases the uh, the oil's even scoured by the particulate material that's in the oil in the on the water itself. So uh, normally oil is lighter than water and would rise to the surface, but then as it breaks into very very small particles and, and are are very small globules, if you will, and it, it, it uh, picks up particles in the specific gravity changes, it gets heavier and heavier and then it can sink. So there's some concern that there even are aggregations of oil lying over the bottom in some places. So it's, it's an incredibly complex issue. We, we need to understand how it's transported. We need to understand uh, where it ultimately goes, in what form it is when it gets there. And then what the effects are uh, as uh, on the biota uh, when it does arrive. And then after that, we have to try to figure out, is the system going to be naturally resilient? Mm -hmm. uh, is it going to go back to the state it used to be at? Or is it going to somehow change to an, to an alternative state? And that's one that's got a lot of people scared. Is this going to have a serious effect on, uh, on, on a juvenile fish? On, on recruitment of new species, on the food, on the food web, you name it. There're just a, a, a lot of possibilities. Some are more far fetched and or less likely, and others uh, are probably are more more likely. So, it's a it's a huge uh, scientific mystery. I, <laughs> I, you know, as a, as one reporter said to me, you know, in a perverse way, this is a fascinating science problem. Yeah, and I and I and I said to her, "Yeah, I suppose you're right. It it is when you try to uh, get your arms around this one. It's a it's it's a lot of science. Yep. And, and the I I'm constantly trying to find 
something good in this terrible event. <laughs> and the, the one good thing I can see is people are all of a sudden taking real interest in the marine environment. They're starting to learn a little bit about oceanography. Uh, they're starting to think a little bit about the science involved. And I'm just hopeful that this will cause maybe a few young people to consider science careers uh, when they didn't otherwise even uh, have that thought in their mind. Yeah, I can absolutely agree with that. It, this unfortunately could be the kind of event that stimulates a lot of interest in, in issues related to uh, oceanography, related to um, you know weather patterns. I mean, a, a question right now is whether or not the, uh, the hurricane season is going to affect the cleanup process, and additionally, whether or not it's going, whether or not the oil in the water is going to affect the actual production of hurricanes. Whether or not there will be, they will be less strong or less able to form with uh, make with the surface of the water covered in oil, um, and then whether or not there's going to be oil spread all over the Gulf by the rains that come through. Well, yeah, the, the whole question of hurricanes is an open. Uh question. We don't have any real way of predicting for sure, but we may unfortunately get an answer next week because yeah. there's something brewing down there right now. And it's, they said it, there was a, when I last heard it was a 40% chance of it term, term, turning into a tropical storm that would, was going to head to the Gulf uh, sometime next week. So uh, that's all we need now is to have to deal with it with a hurricane. But uh, yeah. think about it. Just a hurricane, put up some barrier tape and just say, don't come this way, hurricane. Yeah, just, yeah. just stay away. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, like a, like a vampire. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta put a cross up in front of it to try to scare it away. Um, I, I think the, uh, um, the possibilities are, are, are uh, pretty obvious when you think about it. The first thing we know about a, a storm like that is a lot of energy in it. And it's a great way of dispersing things. So uh, it can, you know, like a washing machine, uh, churn up the surface of the water and, and, and truly disperse the oil. And that's probably a good thing. Uh, the yeah. bad things uh, could be that it could drive oil farther inland than we expected because the tides get higher. You have a storm surge, et cetera. And uh, that, that could have un, unanticipated or unforeseen effects. Uh, yeah. You know, I... It, I, I, I'm just speculating. I don't, I don't have a clue what would happen. It would depend on the track of the storm, the strength of the storm, what side of the storm you're on, whether you're on the strong side or the weak side of the storm. Uh, I'm sure uh, precipitation would be involved as well. Uh, so there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of variables. That's the name of this whole thing. One load of variables. <laughs> <laughs> and they're getting to be, and it just seems like... Every time you find out more, there it opens up more variables. All of a sudden, it, it opens up a new doorway with um, wonderful opportunity for more scientific collaboration among fields because suddenly you're probably getting people who work in fisheries and coastal environments into more inland and agricultural sciences. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a biologist, but uh, I was trying to explain the triple point to somebody the other day when talking about hydrate. So, yeah, you can... You you really get into the complexities here. You have to know a little bit about uh, chemistry. You've got to know about uh, what uh, makes up oil. What are the different fractions? You have to know something about how you analyze for it, um, how it partitions, what microbes do to it, uh, how it can be toxic. All, you know, all these thousands of uh, little, little uh, scientific tidbits that are involved in all phases of this. I'm going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. If you'll just hold on for a second, Dr. Delia. I will. Uh, just going to thank Carbonite, our sponsor for this hour of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. This episode is brought to you by Carbonite. They're the leader in online backup. And, you know, unexpected computer disasters happen all the time, just like unexpected oil spills. And... Some of the most common problems that are out there are you have hard drive failures and viruses. The end result is that you end up losing all your data and the important files on your computer gone. You can't get to them. And so it, it really helps to have a backup. And one of the easiest places so you don't have to have a second drive on your computer or worry about having a server, another external server, a RAID server or something at home that you have to deal with, Carbonite. It's great because it's an online backup service and um, it's safe, it's easy, it's automatic and it's cross-platform PC 
or Mac. Uh, Carbonite helps protect all of the valuable files on your computer, your photos, videos, music. If you've ever lost that kind of stuff, you know how bad that feels. Um, and a few more things that you should know. Uh, your files are encrypted before they leave your computer. So they're safe going out. They're not going to be intercepted by some crazy hacker out there trying to get all your your music and for, I don't know what they want to get from you, but they're not going to be intercepted. They're encrypted uh, for maximum security. And whether you're a novice or you know tons about computers, it's easy to use. It's just very basic. You, you can just click, click, and it's done. It's automatic. Uh, backs it up whenever you're connected to the internet. So just about any time. I mean, most people are connected to the internet all the time right now, so it's constantly backing up what you've got. And you can get your files back in a very easy manner. They're backed up off-site, and you can access those files from any computer. So anywhere, your iPhone, your new iPhone that you just got today, your BlackBerry, with, uh, they have free apps that make it very easy. So if you back it up, you can get it back from wherever you are with Carbonite. So the offer for you from Carbonite... $55 a year, 15 cents a day for unlimited backup for your PC or your Mac. But you can try it for free if you go to www.carbonite.com and enter the offer code KIKI, K-I-K-I. It's that easy. So carbonite.com and enter the offer code KIKI. You get a free trial. And then if you decide to buy the service, you get two months for free. It's a pretty good deal, right? So $55 a year, 15 cents a day. It's very easy. Carbonite.com, free trial. If you buy, if you sign up and decide to go for it, enter the offer code Kiki, and you're going to get two months free. So that's Carbonite.com. Thank you very much for sponsoring this hour of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. And we are back to the wonderful science of the, of the Gulf oil spill. And our guest today is Dr. Chris D'Elia with the Louisiana State University School of, I'm going to get it wrong again, the School of the Coast and Environment. And got it right. I got it right. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I get excited sometimes. <laughs> and we're busy talking about uh, the cleanup process. We're talking about the implications for uh, the environment, the scientific questions that are being uncovered, because we really didn't know that what we didn't know until this started happening, until this happened. Now, I have a whole bunch of questions, like I mentioned earlier, from uh, Twitter, my Twitter followers. Hello, all you Twitterers out there. Um, and and one of the questions that that people were very interested in was um, was the dispersant question, which we already which we already discussed a little bit. But how long is a the question? Another question that's very important is how long are the effects going to be felt in the environment in the Gulf, and how far reaching are the are the estimates for how far out into the Gulf and and beyond? Well, again, they're excellent questions, and I hate to sound dumb, but I don't know the answers. All I can do is tell you that every day that this persists, we have more and more of a problem on our hands. Uh, and again, it's unprecedented in, in terms of its scope, especially near such a productive and wonderful natural environment as the Louisiana coast and, and neighboring uh, Gulf uh, states. So uh, it could be have very profound effects and in any pollution uh, situation you have to worry about dose and exposure and uh, we're getting a big dose and we've got a lot of exposure here so that one would predict that it would have a fairly uh, substantial effects. In addition we have uh, to think about how many years this is going to be uh, with us and are, are there going to be residual effects that go from year to year. I don't think we know but I would say that in Prince William Sound in, in Alaska, uh, uh, 20 years after Exxon Valdez, uh, we still know that certain uh, uh, parts of the ecosystem have not recovered. And uh, for example, the herring fishery has not returned, I'm told, to, to what it was uh, before then. So uh, it is possible that there are residual effects. And the, I, I know that the Exxon Valdez, it was 20 years on since that took place, and, and, we're, and 
they're still finding the signatures of the of the oil that was spilled like in the animals in their in in their tissues uh Do you yeah know about that? And- yeah, and and you know they they did some smart things and some not so smart things there, and you know, we've learned a lot in in that time. Uh, one thing that uh, people are cautioned against doing, and I hope that any listeners from Louisiana uh, are hear this, is uh, don't go and and walk in an oiled marsh, because what you do when you walk in an oil marsh is you put that uh, oil into the ground as your footprint uh, uh, bears down, and once it gets Below the surface, it can be much more toxic and difficult uh, for the marsh grasses, etc. So uh, you've got to be uh, you've got to be very careful what you do. In in, in Alaska, they did some uh, they used the wrong kinds of detergents. They proved to be very toxic. They even tried steam cleaning rocks to get uh, the oil off, and uh, that was a dumb idea because it just <laughs> killed things. So <laughs> so you know. Again, that was sort of one of these uh, these experiments uh, going along and uh, just doing things that look like good ideas. And speaking of which, oh, you can't imagine the number of good ideas that, that are being submitted. What do you think uh, about I, Kevin Costner, Costner's oil cleaning robots? Uh, <laughs> Is that one uh, of them? Yeah. It, it, you know, I, I think that people aren't thinking clearly about the scope of this disaster. If you... If you put it together uh, on an aerial, uh, in an aerial way, if you think about how much area is covered, uh, you'd need a whole lot of vacuum cleaners to suck it up. And that's why it's been proposed that we bring super tankers in the way they did in the Gulf of, uh, 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 over the Arabian Gulf, mm-hmm. and to clean up the spill and, and uh, uh, with truly massive uh, amounts of uh, capability to not only suck it up, uh, but to put it in, 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 in into the uh, holes of the ships. So, uh, you know, we were talking about ways to get rid of oil. Uh, obviously, the dispersants, you can try to bioremediate it. You can try to put down uh, artificial or, or, or cultured uh, bacteria that you know will, uh, will, will chop away at the oil faster. You can add other nutrients to try to make things work faster. You can uh, burn it. And depending on the sea state, that is often a choice that they make. Uh, and so oil on the surface will, will burn, particularly if it has a lot of the, the volatile organic carbon fractions in it still. And then you can physically remove it. So that's about the right. suite of things you can do uh, with the oil. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the uh, burning the oil. If you, uh, it's, it's going to affect stuff on the surface, but you're still, you still have how many gallons of oil that are below the surface that haven't made it up to the surface and that maybe won't even make it up to the surface. And um, then, you have, uh, then you have air pollution issues you have to be concerned about. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it just, uh, there's one thing cascading to the next in a complex situation like this. Yeah. Have you, do you know much about um, the seasonal hypoxic dead zones in the Gulf sure. and, and maybe you know, if that's going to interact with, say, the, the low oxygen that's produced as a result of some of the burning or the chemical dispersants? Yeah, I'll let, yeah I happen to know a lot about hypoxia. That's kind of re- research that I personally have uh, worked on. Um, uh, the, the burning is not going to create hypoxia because that's at the surface and there's plenty of oxygen there and, and that's uh, easily made up for. But what we're concerned about is the microbial degradation of the organic material is done in a way that consumes oxygen. They, they are respiring. Respiration consumes oxygen. And so there is a depression uh, in oxygen uh, that has been observed near the wellhead. Um, I just saw a report that NOAA has, uh, has released not too long ago that summarizes the uh, work they did in the first 30 days. And fortunately, the uh, hypoxia in the deeper water areas uh, was not uh, severe at this stage, and they they uh, they didn't prognosticate. They just said, as as this continues, it is possible for serious hypoxia problems to to ultimately develop. But they had not seen any particular sign of it at, uh, up up at least during the first thirty days. So that's that's good news. Whether this reaches the coast and and becomes a problem there. Uh, is another issue, and uh, I, I know that we have people uh, both at, at my school and at neighboring institutions that are uh, that are involved in studies of hypoxia. 
they've had these studies going on for years and they have their normal summer cruises. So I'm sure they'll tell us if, uh, if they see anything that looks more serious. Hopefully it won't get more serious. Hopefully we'll just to see the normal stuff that happens in the Gulf. And it, hypoxia, is, is hypoxia in the Gulf becoming a larger and larger issue? I know here along the, uh, the Oregon, uh, Northwest, the Northwest states of, of the U.S., uh, there's some serious dead zones that are getting larger every year. Is that, is that occurring in the Gulf as well? It's a global problem, really, as we have produced more and more nitrogenous fertilizer <clears throat> excuse me, for agricultural purposes, <clears throat> we are um, uh, essentially fertilizing the ocean uh, boundaries at, at the coast, and that is uh, causing algae to grow and, uh, in more quantity than we want, and then that stuff will die and decay, and that is what leads to the overconsumption of oxygen and, the, and, and hypoxia, which is, as you have to define, is uh, um, low oxygen, really, low oxygen. Right. Is it possible to, have people looked at pumping oxygen down into these areas? Is there a way to, you know, get giant pumps that cir circulate the water to, to lessen the effects? I, I suppose you could do it in a, in a very limited way, but the fact is that the uh, amount of, uh, of area that you'd have to cover is so great and the amount of energy you'd have to use would be yeah. so great that it just, it just wouldn't be very practical. <laughs> and especially when you're, you've already got oil leaking out. <laughs> you probably would not want to use more oil just to power the pumps that would make that happen. Well, I think, you know, this, this does lead into a whole, a whole nother topic, as they say. Yeah. Uh, and that is uh, U.S. energy use. And uh, this country is really addicted to oil. And we have to understand that. And it's, it's very easy for me to say we need to be less addicted to oil for many reasons, uh, uh, not the least of which is our concern about climate change and the potential effect of oil uh, burning to cause CO2 to increase global uh, warming and uh, then uh, sea level rise, which obviously is something we're worried about down here in Louisiana. Yeah. But uh, the fact is that the entire industrial system and our economy is reliant on this. Our transportation system is reliant on this. Our uh, ability to produce food uh, is is totally dependent on oil right now. Uh, so we are in a position that we can't extricate ourselves very easily from the oil. And so we're kind of in a bind right now. The U.S. is importing 65% of the oil it uses. Something like 30% of that is coming from deep, uh, of, the, of the remainder is coming from a, a deep water uh, oil reserves. So if we cut that out, we get into an even bigger pickle with respect to imports of oil. That's a balance of trade problem in addition to other kinds of problems, such as a security problem. And uh, that leaves the country in a really rough position. I, I know that uh, a lot of people in Florida and California are utterly opposed to any oil exploration off their shores. Yeah, especially uh, now as a, a knee-jerk reaction knee-jerk reaction, but the, the, the fact is they still jump into their, into their Humvees and, and, or, or, or very large automobiles that don't yep. get great gas mileage. And uh, I, I, I have to ask in a somewhat sardonic way um, where they think that oil comes from. It's the same place that you know meat comes from in the in the <laughs> the meat section of the. Exactly. It comes in a little plastic styrofoam container, and that's you know that's where it comes from. <laughs> it's like a cargo cult where the airplanes deliver it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it just comes. The stork brings it. It's that's the stork it. brings. It. <laughs> and so I, you know, we're going to have to have a serious national dialogue with ourselves about about energy, how we use it, where it comes from, et cetera. There are many facile answers out there to how we can make up for the oil that we're not able to produce. But I'll tell you, it's, it, it ain't so easy. The U.S. Uh, uses about 100 quads of energy every year. That's 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy. That's a bundle of energy. It's not easily made up for by uh, wind generation or solar, etc., Certainly wind and solar are going to be important components of any future energy picture we have. But, uh, I, you know, I think uh, uh, people are smoking something they shouldn't be smoking if they think it's going to solve the problem. 
Yeah, if they if they think that's what's going to take care of it, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to to be able to uh, balance out the energy that's produced using oil at this point in time. Um, and I, I I hate to say, you know, it's the same point that you brought up earlier that you know maybe this accident is increasing kids' interests in science. Maybe this is also increasing people's awareness of where oil comes from, of their use of energy. I mean. This is, there are more people talking about oil than I think I've ever seen before. I mean, it, the, the conversations are happening. Yes, they are. But uh, I can tell you, I lived in California in 1973 <laughs> uh, when the, uh, the, the first real oil crisis hit due to the Arab oil embargo. And uh, that's all anybody talked about. I can remember yeah. sitting in, uh, in line, the odd even days in Los Angeles where I lived. I was doing a postdoc at UCLA. And I, I can uh, remember the misery we had just trying to get a little bit of oil to, uh, to run our car. And uh, uh, people talked about oil all the time. It was uh, a major topic in the uh, Nixon, Ford, uh, and Carter administrations. And uh, uh, Jimmy Carter had a plan. He actually understood the problem more than any other president in my lifetime. And uh, where are we now? We're, we're, we're ever more vulnerable to the problem than, than, than I can recall. Uh, so we, we need to do something. I mean, the first and most obvious thing to me is we need to get really serious about conservation. We need to increase the CAFE standards so that uh, the, the fleet mileage uh, of the U.S. Uh, automobile fleet gets vastly higher. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're just going to keep digging ourselves in a, into the hole a lot deeper. And as you know, the law of holes says, when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. <laughs> exactly. Um, talking about the, the kind of the policy aspects of this, um, I, I've read various places around the web that um, local scientists, local to the Gulf, uh, feel like they're being hindered by the federal response, that there's a that there's a, a lack of communication between the science on the federal level and the priorities there versus what local scientists want to do. Do you see that happening? Well, you're a scientist, and you know how dependent uh, those of us in the business of science are on federal grants. And uh, unfortunately, the feds have not been making a lot of money available. I, uh, I I would say, with just a couple of exceptions, the National Science Foundation has a what's called a rapid grant process and they've been extremely helpful about getting a few grants out but they only have so much money and they haven't gotten uh, more as far as I can tell to get uh, more rapids out there the sea grant program a wonderful program that's housed in NOAA has uh, what we call program development money and they've gotten money out but again it's it's small dribs and drabs there really have not been a lot of uh, national level opportunities and I'm told the reason for that is is that the uh, the legal process, the so-called NRDA, the NERDA, uh, National Resource, uh, the Natural Resource uh, uh, Damage Act, that's part of the Oil Pollution uh, Act of 1990, uh, is a very litigious uh, kind of a process, and and the Feds are just simply trying to recover all the money they can from BP and don't want to uh, spend more federal uh, resources with the deficit being what it is. Um, I, I happen to disagree with that. I think this is a, a national emergency like a war and, uh, you, you know, you have to defend yourself and, and you just got to get out there and, and do what you've got to do. And we'll worry about paying for it later because, uh, you know, if we don't do the right things, we're not going to understand what's going on. We're not going to know where we have to act and we're going to not uh, respond properly. Yeah. And the, and the ability to respond properly is what we're what we're hoping to be able to put in place for the for the future. Um, somebody was wondering about in in the chat room was wondering about the uh, the the risks of a of a gas layer being involved. That maybe there's a there would be so much gas and oil um, pushed out into the Gulf that there would be, I guess, just a layer on the Gulf. Yeah, I saw that, and I and I I wouldn't be able to even give you a rational uh, 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 response on that because I just don't know enough about it. But uh, the, the one thing I would point out is from what I can tell, this is a huge reserve of oil they're tapped into. And there is a, con there is a reasonable concern that if they destroy the casing on the well, that it could lead to uh, additional seeps of, uh, 
oil and gas that could be very problematic and uncontrollable. So that is something that people are obviously concerned about. Uh, I've seen some people speculate that it's probably good that Top Hat failed because that could have caused a well casing fail, failure. I, you know, I'm not a petroleum geologist or a petroleum mm -hmm. engineer, so right. I can't, I can't do more than speculate. It just, I will say that's been some of the chatter I've seen, and yeah. Lord knows there's a lot of chatter. <laughs> and is there, there, is there a lot of chatter in the scientific circles as well? Um, I mean, I know there's a, just a, in general, a lot of chatter. There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of, there are a lot of questions. Um, does that seem? Do people have a in the, in the scientific circles, are they are they pretty laser focused on particular questions, or is there is it kind of well, all over the place as well? There are three categories. There's a lack of information is one category, which I think is what many of us in the scientific community have complained about, particularly the earlier phases of this. It's getting a little bit better now. There is misinformation where wrong information is inadvertently given out, and then there's disinformation where somebody deliberately tries to mislead. And, uh, you know, obviously people that have a strong opinion one way or the other, uh, say uh, extremely pro-oil, pro-drilling, or extremely anti-oil, anti-drilling, would try to mislead and, and thereby influence their case. Um, what we want to do is just get the most accurate, unbiased information we can. It's scientifically objective and, uh, and understand that that's not going to lead to simple, easy, yes, no answers. Uh, it takes time. It's a process uh, that you, you continue to refine your knowledge and get better and better answers. And that's what we want uh, as scientists in the Gulf. We're getting to the end of our hour. Is there anything that, um, you know, related to the science uh, that, we, that we haven't really covered that you'd, you know, love to tell people about, um, you know, ways to think about what's happening or just something from your own personal perspective on the entire situation? Well, I, I, I would go back to the conversation we were having about national energy use and energy policy. This country needs a rational energy policy, and it's going to be essential that we use a variety of energy sources in order to, to meet our needs. And uh, that is something we've got to start talking about. Uh, I know nuclear has been unpopular, but I think nuclear is an option that, that simply has to be considered at this point because we have preempted other options and that's the thing that people need to understand is by the way and amount we use energy uh, we really have put ourselves in a corner uh, I would like to see us use less energy be more careful about this very valuable thing uh, called energy mm -hmm. and I would like to think about diversifying our sources with sources that are consistent with the laws of thermodynamics uh, where you don't get uh, uh, something that doesn't exist out of the air and where you understand that every time you do an energy transformation, uh, it's going to cost you energy. Yep. And with that, I would like to thank Dr. Chris D'Elia from the Louisiana State University uh, School of the Coast and Environment for joining me today, talking with us about the Gulf oil spill, talking, us, talking to us about the science, the energy, the, uh, the information that's out there and all the questions, the variables that are growing in number from day to day as we learn more about this entire situation. If you'd like to learn more about, uh, about the oceans, about uh, what's happening with the science of the Gulf oil spill, you can go to the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. That is oceanleadership.org is the website. And they have some really great information at this at the website. Um, they had a symposium earlier this month and there's a, a wealth of information there from various scientists on this topic and they have um, a lot of media sources that you can look at and learn a lot about many different topics, um, including I, this, this oil spill issue. Yes, Chris. I would agree, Kiki. I thank, I thank you very much for the chance to talk to you. We're members of the consortium, uh, and uh, I think it's one of the best websites I've ever seen. So it's a great place to look, and I uh, hope people take a look at it. Great. I hope so. I hope so, too. Finding out more information is always the way to empower yourself in any situation. And with that, I am Dr. Kiki Sanford. This has been the Science Hour. If you would like to find past episodes of the Science Hour, you can go to twit.tv forward slash 
Kiki. And there's all sorts of ways for you to, don- do- to download old episodes. Additionally, you can find us on YouTube and you can watch live every Thursday from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Pacific time if, if you have the time in your daily schedule and weekly schedule to fit a little bit, bit of science in. Because you know, if you do fit a little bit of science in, just an hour, that's all I ask. It does make your world a whole lot more interesting. Thanks for listening.